Second Nephi 13 is where those lists, those words, uh, words come from, which we discussed last week. So today we have Second Nephi 26 through 30. Just a brief overview here. Uh, Christ shall visit the Nephites. It's prophesied about that. We have Isaiah 29. We have the discussion about the, the Satan's church and his philosophies in there. 20, uh, 29, we have the rejection of the Book of Mormon by the world. And then 30, the gathering of Israel. Just a brief overview. Not very many chapters this week. So let's just dive in and discuss a few verses that, uh, that I like. And then if you have any ones uh, that you want to pull out, we're happy to do so. So go to 2 Nephi 26, please. 2 Nephi chapter 26. 2 Nephi 26. This is a, a, a maybe more of a personal one, so I'd like to hear your opinion on this. 2 Nephi 26, verse 29. Go to verse 29. It says, He commandeth that there shall be no priestcrafts. For behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world but they seek not the welfare of Zion. And Nephi said it was priestcrafts that had the Savior crucified. So here's my question. Do I practice priestcrafts because I get paid, I get gain, to teach? Well, you don't set yourself up for life into the world that you can gain and gain praise of the world. How do you know? Well, I kind of know you because I'm in your world. <laughs> and you're still here. <laughs> I don't think that's true. But okay. I, and I think that it's really hard for a person on the outside to know what the inside of another person is doing. And so we could maybe judge another one of those TV preachers and say exactly what this is. But not really <coughs> knowing them in the way that the Lord knows them we wouldn't be able to know anyway. We shouldn't be judging them. So is there impossible to judge if someone else is practicing priestcraft? Um, Think about that for a moment. I want to hear your comment. Oh, I, uh, the, the last part of that is I, I believe that you seek the welfare of Zion. And uh, your flock, you feed your, your flock, and we are your flock. And, and we, in turn, I do anyway. I've got a couple other uh, guys to take up to you. Come follow me, and also in the church, and I pass some of the knowledge that I came from you. You, you, okay. I, I, I don't quote you, you know, but I, yeah. <laughs> You said that you're my flock. That has a ministerial uh, meaning behind that, because the word bishop is the same root word for pastor which he's the minister over the flock. But I don't have any ministerial authority here. Right? Does that make a difference? I have zero ecclesiastical authority. You cannot come confess one sin to me. And if you did, I would just tell you to go talk with somebody else, right? Yeah? And we are all ministers. We have uh, ministering brethren. Ministering That's a good point. But you don't get paid to minister. I do get paid to teach. Is there a difference? What do you think? I've been all my life just finally figuring out what uh, priestcraft was. I really did not know. There's your definition right there, right? Yeah. yeah. So when Lehi, in Lehi's dream, when did Lehi say, Lame and Lemuel, hold my hand and, I'm gonna, and I'm, I'll be your guide? He never did that. We've talked about this. What did he do? He said, grab onto the rod of iron. Get onto the pathway. Well, and we discussed this. Who's the rod and, and who's the path? It's the Savior. So I hope, because this is a fine line. I used to think it was broad because I have no ecclesiastical authority. But then, do the general authorities get paid to be general authorities? Do you know? I think we know. Talk with several of them that uh, had they had 
a church credit card. I have a church credit card. I only purchase mine through certain things for work. Well, you can say that about a relief site present sometimes. Explain. Well, sometimes you have to go uh, buy for That's people right. that are in need. That's right. And the church likes their card because it's a whole lot easier for them than it is a million reimbursements, especially for me who might have a lot here and then there. I want to hear both. Well, they get paid like when they travel and do all this stuff. That's all paid for, right? Okay. Well, they get expenses, and that's different than right. being salaried. Right, right. But they're not being paid. Well, what about somebody who might be in my circumstance, who's a church employee, not independently wealthy? not retired and gets called to be a general authority. Some of the brethren receive stipends. Cost of living is taken care of. I've wondered about that. I write mm -hmm. books. Like Several of them do, not all. Please, Sandy. I have a quote here, and a silly moi, I did not put who did the quote, but it was from the November 1999 incident. <laughs> I didn't put the name though, but it says, Therefore, let us beware of false prophets and false teachers, both men and women, who are self-appointed declarers of the doctrine of, of the church and who seek to spread their false gospel. If you want to make it 51 big guy, here we go. Spread their false gospel and attract followers by sponsoring, <laughs> anyway, sponsoring symposia, books, and journals whose contents challenge fundamental doctrines of the church. You're not challenging fundamental doctrines of the church. Thank That's you. For a big, huge difference, okay? It's a big, huge difference. Are you doing it up there? <laughs> <laughs> Your husband was laughing at you. That's a great quote. It was President Ballard, or Elder, then Elder Ballard. Did I get ahead of you? I'm no, kidding. no, it's exactly, it's a perfect quote. Okay, where did I leave off? Beware of those who speak and publish in opposition to God's true prophets and who actively proselyte others with reckless disregard for the eternal well-being of those whom they seduce. Like Nahor and Korahor in the Book of Mormon, they rely on sophistry to deceive and entice others to their views. They set themselves up for light unto the world that they may yet gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. So how can a general authority who's publishing books, or me teaching this class, or anyone else, avoid priestcrafts? Or you? Because a Relief Society president could all be about her. Don't the brethren, regardless of who they are, have to go through like a clearance process to publish? Yes, in fact, uh, general authorities can't publish fiction. I found that a colleague of mine used to publish a lot of books, fiction. And when he was called to be a general authority, they said, that's your last book. No fiction from general authorities anymore. Interesting. And... There, we learned from a uh, state conference here a while ago, they don't write any talks unless it's a general conference talk. And that goes through correlation. Uh, I, I was thinking yeah. that when they do publish, sure. that it goes through a correlation process or a review process. But you'll notice, and, and they can do that. Desert Book is really good because that's usually who publishes their books. But you'll notice they have several comments in there that this is the work well, of me. They don't do anything to promote themselves as the big leader in any way to take away from the prophet uh, or to line their own pockets. They simply serve and try to get along on what they have. And see, that's really, really one reason why I have not put any of my stuff out on the internet. I hesitate to do that, and now I've told you I'm going to because people have asked. So you tell me, and then you can apply it to your life. How can we prevent it being... What size? Oh, it's Nephi's wording. Set myself up as a light to get gain, praise of the world, seek not the welfare of Zion. I think the key word is set myself up. That's what I hear for it. If I'm self promotion, like the TV evangelists or whoever you want to make more reverence there, these brethren basically just do what they've been asked to do. They've been called and set apart to function in a certain office and do certain things. But they didn't volunteer. They didn't promote themselves into that. I mean, you know. Thank you. That's, I appreciate that. So think about it. If you're a primary teacher, you could be the glory of that class. 
And those little kids could think you're the most amazing person on the planet. They do anyway. <laughs> how, can, how can we make sure that we don't let the praise of the world? Our every thought and action needs to be based on spirit of the Lord. Yeah. Well, it makes you good to feel, have good things said about you, but we have to always be on guard that we stay humble. There was a quote that I learned long ago. A man who thinks he is humble will cease to be humble. Yeah, I... I I'm really good at being Yeah. <laughs> Humility was something we perfected last century. Let's move on to something new, right? Moving on. Love it. Thank you for sharing that. So I think one of my favorite things to hear isn't, oh, I was in Brother Griffith's class. It was amazing. I, much rather, I learned so much from the Spirit in the class. Give credit where credit goes. Love it. Thank you. Go to chapter uh, 27 then. And if you have... Chapter 27 is the Book of Mormon account of Isaiah 29. So we're going to go to Isaiah 29 first. If you, some of you uh, get two screens on your phone or if you have hard scriptures, bookmark them. If you would, please go to Isaiah. Isaiah 29. The first word in Isaiah 29. What is it? Whoa. Yeah, what does that mean again? It means grief, pain, suffering. It's a de declaration of careful, but you're going to feel grief, pain, and suffering for this. Now, notice the third word in there. Woe to... Okay, check your footnote. Tell me what that means. What chapter is Isaiah? Isaiah 29, first verse. Thank you. Isaiah 29, first verse. This is not the little mermaid. Check the footnote. What does Ariel mean? Okay, it means altar or hearth. I want to make sure you know what this is. What's a hearth? It's like in front of your fireplace. That's right. It's the you traditionally the brick that goes around it and you Yeah. So if you'll notice in Isaiah 29, verse 1, woe to Ariel to Ariel, the city. So he's talking about a city here, the city where David dwelt. Okay, what city is that? What's the city of David? He's actually talking about Jerusalem in this case, the capital city. Add ye, add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices. He's giving, he's prophesying here the destruction of Jerusalem. This is Isaiah talking. Remember, Isaiah is talking, he's preaching from Jerusalem, but he's talking about the destruction that's about to take place in Israel which is up north. Verse 2, Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. Now, the term Ariel is only used in Isaiah. It's used five times, and all of them are in this chapter. So if we know that the word really means uh, altar or hearth, it's a sacrificial hearth. That's where you would place in Solomon's temple, it's the highest tier of the altar, where if you would put the sacrifice on that, it would burn it, purify it. So if you take this word and add it in, like in verse 2, the second word of Ariel, yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as a sacrificial heart. So what is he telling he's going to do to the city? Sacrifice it. He's going to cleanse it. He's going to purify it. And then it will come back eventually, right, to be greater. And I, verse 3, and I will camp against thee round about. Now, if you'll notice the footnote 1a, there's a Joseph Smith translation that goes through and adds some clarification on that. We won't, we won't go through that now, but you can study that. That's a great thing to go through and look. The verse that I want to look at, though, is in, in Isaiah 29, verse 7. And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, again, we're talking Jerusalem, even all that fight against her and her munition, and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. 
Now, that's what it says in the Isaiah account. But in the Book of Mormon account, this is 2 Nephi 27, verse 3. You can go back. I know we're bouncing back and forth. 2 Nephi 27, verse 3. And all the nations that fight against Zion. So in the Book of Mormon, they change the word from Ariel, referring to Jerusalem, to Zion which we know takes on a much broader concept. So there's a couple of ways you can look at Isaiah 29. And, uh, and just work with me on some of these thoughts and, and definitions. One, he might be talking to the Jerusalem. It's going to be destroyed eventually. And then later on, what happens in chapter 29, right? The uh, new scriptures come forth. And people could say, well, we're expecting new scriptures to come forth out of Jerusalem, which has happened, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls. Some people say, well, it's also, uh, let's go, since you're in 2 Nephi 26, right? Jump back to 26 just for a moment. Uh, 26 verse 16. Can someone read that for us? I need a reader for a minute. Who wants to read a few verses? Okay. Out loud. 26, 16. For those who shall be destroyed shall speak unto them out of the ground, and their speech shall be low out of the dust, and their voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit. For the Lord God will give unto him power, that he may whisper concerning them, even as it were, out of the ground, and their speech shall whisper out of the dust. For thus saith the Lord God, they shall write the things which shall be done among them. And they shall be written and sealed up in a book. And those who have dwindled in unbelief shall not have them, for they seek to destroy the kingdom of God. Okay, we'll, we'll pause right there for a second. How can you write from the dust of the earth? How can you write when you're dead? I can write it in my journal and read it. That's exactly right. We're talking records here. So notice in here, he could be talking about the people of Jerusalem will be destroyed and records will come out later, years later, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. It could also be, which we know in our church is true, he's talking about not just the Jews in Jerusalem, but the remnants of Joseph who take off. That's Lehi and his family, right? One more reference. Jump to this one. Mormon chapter 8. Book of Mormon. Chapter 8, verse 23. Mormon 8, verse 23. You still there? Please read. Search the prophecies of Isaiah. Behold, I cannot write them. Yea, behold, I say unto you that those saints who have gone before me, who have possessed this land, shall cry. Yea, even from the dust will they cry unto the Lord. And as the Lord liveth, he will remember the covenant which he hath made with them. So not only do we have Isaiah saying that the Jews will be destroyed, they'll be sacrificed to pure, be purified, and their records will be coming from the ground, but we also have a group of people here in America doing the same thing. So you'll see the picture I put up here. I mean, Mormon is doing the same thing. He's writing a record, and he's burying it in the ground, and it will come forth from the dust, the dirt of the ground, and it will declare that the city, not just Jerusalem, but as the Book of Mormon says in 2 Nephi, uh, Zion will be redeemed. So there's a lot of dual meaning in there with the word Ariel. <laughs> Jerusalem, Zion, America. We have a lot of records that have come forth. I'd like to talk about a couple of them for a moment here. This, let me switch pictures for a minute here. You know the story, Martin Harris took a, he had Joseph Smith write down the, uh, the characters and take him to New York so Charles Anthem could read them. Uh, let's just read the, the Joseph Smith history account for a moment here. Go to Joseph Smith history, chapter 1. If you go to chapter 2, you went too far.
Okay, Joseph Smith history. This is in the Pearl of Great Price, so you got to find the Pearl of Great Price first. Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith history. Scroll down to verse 63. Way down there towards the bottom. 63. Jo Joseph Smith history. There's only one chapter. That was my joke. Scroll down to verse 63. It starts with sometimes in this month. Sixty-three, all the way down there. It's a long way. Yeah, it's way down there. Let's let's keep reading. Verse sixty-three. Sometime in this month of February, the aforementioned Mr. Martin Harris came to our place, got the characters which I had drawn off the plate, and started with them to the city of New York. For what took place relative to him and the characters, I refer to his own account of the circumstances, as he related them to me after his return. Now notice, Joseph Smith is telling a second-hand story here nine years, if I do my math right, after it happened. Keep going. Let's read a little bit about this. I went to the city of New York and presented the character which had been translated with the translation thereof to Professor Charles Anton, a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. Professor Anton stated that the translation was correct, more so than any he had before seen translated from the Egyptian. I then showed him those which were not yet translated, and he said that they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyric, and Arabic, and he said they were true characters. He gave me a certificate certifying to the people of Palmyra that they were true characters, and that the translation of such of them as had been translated was also correct. I took the certificate and put it into my pocket, and was just leaving the house when Mr. Anton called me back and asked me how the young man found out that there were gold plates in the place where he found them. I answered that an angel of God had revealed it unto him. He then said to me, Let me see that certificate. I accordingly took it out of my pocket and gave it to him. When he took it and tore it to pieces, saying that there was no such thing now as ministering of angels, and that if I would bring the plates to him, he would translate them. I informed him that part of the plates were sealed, and that I was forbidden to bring them. He replied, I cannot read a sealed book. I left him and went to Dr. Mitchell to sanction what Professor Anton had said respecting both the characters and the translation. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll stop right there. If you're familiar with the Joseph Smith papers, you know what those are? Uh, the church has opened up everything. They, a lot of these things have been locked up in the archives for a long time, 200 years. The church says, we're going to open everything up that Joseph Smith has ever written, ever said, ever documented about him. And they have historians, scholars, professionals going in and they're organizing and, and they have put everything on the website. You can even buy the books, uh, volumes of the Joseph Smith papers, they call it. With this opening up and the scholars going in and, and really dissecting everything, we've learned a lot about Joseph Smith and what's really going on. We've always relied on this account, which is a great account. It's the 1838 account. It's in our scriptures. But there's obviously a lot uh, to the story uh, that we can add with this. For example, this is an actual document that was believed to be the paper Martin Harris had that he took to New York. It's in the reorganized uh, archives, uh, now known as the Community of Christ. But scholars have gone in and they've analyzed it and they said, that's not the original. They believe it was uh, um, one of the Whitmers. I can't remember his name right off. It's his handwriting. And you can see that when they wrote characters here, you can see how they're, they curve the characters around it. So this was written first. This is in his handwriting. And he didn't even know Joseph Smith in 1828, 29. He didn't know him until it was 30, 31. So this has to be a document that was created later. So they've had a really some great things with this. Also going through, they found lots of records. And I'll read a few things here that will be helpful. But Martin Harris, remember, he was a wealthy man. He had a revelatory experience just to go find Joseph Smith. 
He already had a witness that the Book of Mormon is true, and it hadn't even been published yet. He had a witness of the gold plates. He went and talked to Joseph Smith, and he had a friend by the name of Luther Bradish. He was a wealthy man who lived in Albany, New York. They believe Martin went first to this man to try to get funds to publish the Book of Mormon. And we also believe Joseph Smith is trying to find help in translating it. In other words, he's like, can we go find someone who can translate these plates for us? We always assume it's just Joseph Smith doing the translation, but up to this point, Joseph, he doesn't know how he's going to do it. He's translated a few characters with the seer stone and so forth, the Urim and Thummim, but he has not done a full-scale production of this. So Martin Harris goes to Luther Brandish. We, we see absolutely zero financial support come through Brandish, but it was probably this Brandish guy who recommended Dr. Mitchell in New York City because he was in Albany. Remember Albany's? Is that the capital, right? Capital. That's the power of New York. He says, go to New York City and go meet this Dr. Mitchell. He knows the languages and he can help you. Dr. Mitchell meets with Martin Harris first, and he probably says, why don't you go talk with Charles Anthon? He's this new young guy, up and coming. From what we know about Charles Anthon, Anthon here, probably didn't even speak Egyptian. But, I'm trying to say this nicely, sometimes these young up and coming scholars want to profess to know more than they really do. It was probably, he knows that. I'll tell you what he did know. Uh, Anthon was a, uh, accomplished in the classic languages of Greek and Latin. Probably didn't know any Middle Eastern languages. So when he gets that, and he's like, yes, this is great. I'm so oh, you're good. Come on in. He goes through and he says, yeah, those look like Egyptian. Probably didn't know. Writes the certificate, goes and then rips it up. He says, bring it here. He, he wants the credit and glory. However, when he goes back to uh, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell's the one who's really interesting here because he is the one who's the leading expert in the Rosetta Stone. You know what that is? That's that stone, that giant uh, translator because they had three languages on it. He is the expert in that. He's the one that probably could have done this. And he had an intense interest in hieroglyphic writing, had been studying the origins of the American Indians, and spent years painstakingly developing his own two races theory of ancient America. So he's the one that would have been the one who would have been most interested in this. But he didn't. And Martin Harris knows now, by revelation before, but now people looking at this saying, there's legitimacy to this. Martin Harris goes back and at this time, willingly and freely, mortgages his farm to pay for it. So, so there's some really cool stuff with it. I'll show you one more picture here. Um, again, this is an actual document. You can go to, if you want to do a search, type in Joseph Smith Papers, uh, the uh, Martin Harris Charles Anthon document. You can look at it, a live picture of it. It's great. It looks, it's a, it's a copy of it right there. And this is Charles Anthon. Obviously, the pictures are much later in life. He becomes a, a famous scholar. There's the actual document. And that's the web address, josephsmithpapers.org. You can go there. You can find any of this. You can read all. They have originals of everything that they have scanned in there, and you can look at them. It's great. A lot of fun. Oh, let's move on because we're already halfway done. Let's go to 2 Nephi 28. 2 Nephi 28. Before we move on, does anyone have any questions? So when we do the Isaiah readings this week and it talks about a sealed book and you can't read it and it's coming from the ground, I just wanted to give you a little history behind that and the story of Martin Harris and what we know a little more recent because of the research that's been done. Anyone have any questions? Okay, let's go to 2 Nephi 28 then. 2 Nephi 28. One of the things that's interesting with this is 
Nephi is just teaching here, and we really aren't sure in some of these sections here if it's a continuation of Isaiah or if Nephi is expounding on it. In other words, he may have access through the brass plates more of Isaiah's record than we have in our, our, our Bible, but he's talking here some great things about what he sees. If you go to verse 2 for a moment, this is Second Nephi, Nephi 28, verse 2. And the things which shall be written out of the book shall be of great worth unto the children of men, and especially unto our seed, which is a remnant of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the churches which are built up and not unto the Lord. So he's talking about the establishment of churches, but not the church of Jesus Christ. And definitely not the church of Jesus Christ restored in the latter days. So I would just like us to go through here and see if we can find elements of what a false church or a church of the devil entails. So glance to verse 3. Do you see anything that would... How do you know if it's a false church or not according to verse 3? Well, we kind of read that one already. Go to verse 4. What do we know about churches in verse 4? Okay, but in aspect, don't we kind of do that? Don't we proclaim all other churches are false? How is that not contentious? Um, it's been about 15, 20 years ago. Winchester Sun put out part of uh, 79 different churches in the Clark County, <clears throat> which is a small county, a little over 300 square miles. And of course, we were one of those 79. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was amazing to me that they were that many. And they don't all teach the same. Doctrine. Oh, no. They all profess Christ if they're a Christian, right? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. One county, you know, out of 120 yeah. in Kentucky. Isn't there a scripture in the Book of Mormon that says there are two churches only? Yeah. There's the church of the devil and there's the true church. So, really, even though there's so much more than a lot of other religions and the things that they do, there's really only one truth. So would you be comfortable going to another church and saying, this is the church of the devil right here? I would not be comfortable doing that either. So how do you know if it's the church of the devil? I think you could have a church that's not a church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's not church of the devil. How could that be possible? Yes. There's lots of churches that do really great things. Yeah. I've got lots of friends not of my faith that are really good Christians, and yeah. they inspire me to be a better Christian. So, even though the church might not have the whole truth, they do lots of good. They're well, sincere. And do we have the whole truth? It's, it hasn't yet been. It's been That's been right. <laughs> we do not have a monopoly on truth. They're sincere in what they know. And oh, absolutely. My my son goes to a Catholic school. He goes to Mass every week. <laughs> I've been. I watch, observe, and I've talked with both the father of the uh, Catholic Church there and the principal of the school he goes to. Both really good, really good people. Fullness of what? Ah, now you're getting there. What does every church lack except the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Authority. We do not have a monopoly on truth because there's doctors and scientists and other people coming up with things that we don't know about. But we do have a monopoly on authority to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ with his authority takes just that, his authority. And so when they contend with one another, I really don't think we contend in the same aspect. We just declare truth. This Joseph Smith is a prophet. Priesthood was restored through him. These are the keys. These are the ordinances. This is the ministration of the church. Um, yeah. Did anybody uh, convince uh, I know this trip Russell Nelson from uh, hear him to speak? Just no. What, what, tell me what your oh his email that he sent out. His email. Yeah. Do you 
Oh, that. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Great. If you don't know what she's talking about, President Nelson sent an email to everyone in the church who has an email. And now it's in the app. Thank you for sharing that. And it's a letter asking us to do something. What was it? To listen and know, know how we hear it. Right? Joseph Smith heard the voice of God. How do you hear it? We'll talk about that at the end in about 20 minutes. It's really great. Yeah, it's fabulous. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a good tie with how we're going to end today. Yes? I just want to tell you that I'm experienced. It's been years since I was in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. in a regular, you know, one of their services. So I went with my niece, and this is in Florida. And it was very interesting. They sang regular songs, hymns. That was different. The priest actually came down and stood <coughs> in the middle of the, you know, pulpit there. And he taught about good and the bad. And it was just like we would talk or give a talk in church. That, to me, was astonishing. Mm -hmm. Because normally, he reads and they read. And none of it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. But so that's how they, they've come a long way. Yeah, I think the little priest that, uh, uh -huh. I say little because he's a short little guy, uh, a, a, the, the, the church, Catholic church in Georgia where my son goes to school, he does great. He comes down and he has a discussion. Yeah. And when I was there, they talked about the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And it was good. Okay. So, but we don't need to contend. We just need to declare truth. I think there's a difference with that. Now go to verse 5. This one's an interesting one, though. We're still in 2 Nephi 28. Verse 5, what's the sign of the church of the devil there? They deny the power of God. And again, what's the power of God? It's, and it's manifested through ordinances. So if there's a church that declares you don't need ordinances, and there are many of those, just believe. They're missing the power of God and the authority to do those ordinances. That's the temple. What else is in verse 5? There's more in there. I mean, when I look at the denying of the power of God, and also that there is no God today, for the Lord and Redeemer has done His work, it's like there's nothing new. That's right. But yet we have new things all the time. And they miss the whole precept in the principle that Isaiah just taught, that in the latter days, new scriptures will come forth. And we can interpret that today as President Nelson's going to stand up at conference and deliver scripture. Prophet speaking the word of God. That's a great point. Thank you. Notice verse 5, though, right in the middle of verse 5. What's another uh, principle or a doctrine of this false church? There is no God today. Satan is really good at that today, making people believe there is no God. He is powerful. You do not see God in, in TV shows and movies and the, the media, right? We, we, it's just not there. It's almost absent. You can't even talk about him in schools, right? Yep. Okay, now go down to verse 6. What's a belief of the church of the devil in verse 6? No more miracles. Excellent. Verse 7. Yea, there shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. In other words, the philosophy of the adversary here is do whatever you want. You're going to die anyway. Uh, the terminology they, uh, the, the young adults use is you only live once, so go do whatever you want. YOLO. YOLO, and they abbreviate it. But verse 8, there's some who aren't going to get trapped with that philosophy. So, eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God, because he will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, take the advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor. There is no harm in this. And my little nine-year-old girl's like, are we supposed to dig a pit for our neighbor? <laughs> no, but we do this. It's okay if you're not perfect. This is Satan's emphasis in do whatever you want. Nobody's perfect. In other words, remove repentance. We're finding that contrast battle going on in life today. Uh, 
we we teach repentance. God is always Christ is always reaching out, and and you're worth saving regardless of how bad you've gone. And it's true, but yet Satan is turning that around and saying, "Oh, you can do anything you want to. Just repent before you die." Right. Or don't need to repent because the Savior will He'll just take care of you. Yes. I feel like there's a lot of that going on maybe inside the church too, like trying to push the line or have Satan trying to help us push the line on on certain aspects yeah. of gospel living, on modesty or Sabbath day worship or you know, whatever it is. I think even inside the church sometimes it can be hard to stay to to do what we want to do because we want to do it. Like yeah. You don't even need to go to church. It's family centered anyway, right? <laughs> what are we missing? We're missing the ordinance. The sacrament. Yeah. And the killing the spirit. Yeah. So let's keep going here. There's a few more in here. Uh, notice what he calls those doctrines in verse 9. I really like these. The church of the devil was those previous eight verses. But here's how he's explaining them and defining them and exposing them. What does he call them? Give me some words. False. Yes. False. Excellent. All. Oh, and false. notice what's going to be the result in verse 10. Again, here's the cry from the ground. The saints that have gone forth, that the scriptures and the teachings and the beliefs that Isaiah and other prophets have declared that have been trampled on, they will cry from the ground. Oh, verse 12, because of pride, because of false teachers, false doctrines, their churches have become corrupted. Verse 13, they rob the poor because of their fine sanctuaries. They rob the poor because of their fine clothing. Boy, I don't know if you know this, but just recently the, there was an article in the, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, about the church. The National Enquirer on Kroger shelves right now. Is it right now? About the finances of the church? Yeah, they are trying. They're really good at this. You read that article and they say how much wealth the church has accumulated. And what they're trying to do is assume and make the connection that if you're wealthy, you're robbing the poor. And they even have people who are like, oh, yeah, we shouldn't even have to pay tithing anymore because we have so much money. I'm like, oh, there's a whole doctrine in there they're misunderstanding. And then they quote somebody else who says, maybe we can redirect our tithing. Instead of paying 10% to the church, maybe we could give half of it to help poor people. And they're totally misinterpreting. Because I want you to take a moment in here and see how many of our church leaders are living up a life of luxury. As Remember we talked about priestcrafts. Mm -hmm. Whatever started, it comes around, right? How many of our church leaders live a life of luxury? You could argue that maybe. Right? Please, I want to hear what you think. Oh, no, I just got an interesting over the weekend with Elder Pace. Several times I got to hear him. You know, he stands up and he says, "I'm happy to be here. I am missing my grandson's baby blessing. My wife wanted to be here too, but she couldn't because she's at home with all of my family, celebrating this this family event. But I'm happy to be here with you. Like, I mean, they are gone every weekend. And although I I know they don't live in luxury, but they sacrifice so much of their their family time. He didn't, he didn't fly in his personal Learjet here." <laughs> Drive a Maserati when he got here? I think I heard that President Hinckley lives in the Cape Cod his whole life. He, uh, President Hinckley? Yeah. No, he lived, uh, the church prof, the president of the church has an apartment. The church has an apartment for him that's yeah. right across. And... But the tree they got for the pulpit was behind the Cape Cod home. No, that's his house in Mill Creek. It's in Utah. Salt Lake oh. City where he grew up. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's a cherry tree. No, I, I and President Monson lived in uh, uh, an area too because I taught his grandkids. Well, and the thing is, possibly President Nelson may have abundance, but he was a heart surgeon. I mean, a lot of it he brought in with him. It's not that the uh, he, he was giving church funds to. Yeah. I, I'm not saying he lives lavishly. I have no idea. But I think he, the guy's a heart surgeon. He probably has a pretty nice house. <laughs> And he paid his tithing, which was some 
Yeah. Why the sound? Oh, I'm sure about that. <laughs> yeah, it, really interesting here. My brother lives in Texas, and uh, he told me of, of a, I believe it was a neighbor who goes to a church. And uh, the church, the, the guy shows up on the big screen, and he pulls up in a, a fancy sports car like a Maserati, and the opening scene, there's smoke on the stage and the screen, and the door opens up, and his leg comes out, and it's one of those fancy snakeskin leather or Italian boots, and he comes out wearing the very expensive suits, and then he walks out of the car and in, and then you know the smoke and the music and the band plays, and he comes up on stage, and everyone cheers and it claps. And my brother uh, said, "Why would you go to a church like that?" He goes, "Oh, it's fun. It's a show." It's entertainment. And my brother's like, you're paying money for that. He's like, oh, yeah, because you buy tickets to go watch these things and so forth. And, and, and I don't want to contend or, or pick on all those other churches, but I don't see prophets and apostles and great men and women who assist them living luxurious, luxuriously like the world might want us to think. The church apparently does have a lot of money. But instead of picking on them, hold on, instead of picking on them for having that, shouldn't we compliment them for practicing what they preach? Save for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. Food storage. Live within your means. And they've also given billions to charity. With a B. All over the world. Regardless of, you know, like they helped build a, a mosque, you know, I mean, it's just. Yeah. And we, President Hinckley, I really loved his answer. He goes, we are not a, a, a church that's in the process of acquiring, even though we do that. We're a church that spends We don't speculate. But you know how much a building like this costs? Do you know how much it costs to maintain? Do you know how many buildings there are? Do you know how much it costs to build these temples? And that's a good point too. And to maintain them and to and we're not slowing down. And we're building buildings like that in places where, let's be honest, that country's tithing is not gonna cover it. But then when you look at the fact that the buildings are cleaned by church members, if you um, have a temple nearby, you might be doing laundry. Your ward's turn to do the laundry and to clean. I mean, that's the way it is in Gilbert, Arizona. Yeah. They rotate through all the space and do all that. Not heavy maintenance, but they do the day-to-day. -day. Um, and, and I think that people couldn't even imagine that that's how it works. And during the the... 2008, when we had the economic, is depression an appropriate word? Uh, uh, when major cities were shutting down and just people vacating them, Salt Lake City was being built up. I mean, the church, through its financial resources, built that downtown area, and it is nice. Uh, Malachi says he paid tithes and offerings. The Lord would bless us. That's right. And we could build the conference center and pay cash for it. Throughout the history of the world, that has not been able to happen before. Well, I went to the, um, the, uh, the John Denver Temple with the church architect because I was staying in front of the general party and not paying it. Um, sure. But he said, he said that every temple is paid in cash. Oh, yeah. And the Jordan River Temple was the last temple that they collected special temple funds for. They used to, before, <clears throat> before they would go around and they'd say, okay, every ward needs to pay so much money, we're going to build a temple in your temple district now. And I was just a kid, but I remember that each family had a certain amount of money that they were supposed to, to donate to build the temple. Now it's all coming through tithing. And your ward building funds are gone. That's right. The ward budget. Some of you remember... You used to pay your tithing and then award budget to maintain all of that. 
uh, yeah, you, you and I have all seen the blessings of tithing. We pay less and less. And it's all comes through tithing now. It's great. Uh, let's do a couple more things. Let's do... Oh, we only have a few more minutes, and I want to end with President Nelson. So let's just go straight there. Uh, the last little bit is all about the redemption of, of Zion in the latter days. Uh, President Nelson, in our most recent general conference, this was the last talk of our most recent conference, President Nelson says, he's talking about the year 2020, thus the year 2020 will be designated as a bicentennial year. General conference next April, which is now only, what, six weeks away? Oh, Five weeks away? Will be different from any previous conference. In the next six months, I hope that every member and every family will prepare for a unique conference that will commemorate the very foundations of the restored gospel. You may wish to begin your preparation by, and he's going to give some suggestions here. That's why I wanted to talk about this. Because we now have a prophet giving us latter-day revelation of how to redeem Zion. Reading a fresh Joseph Smith's account of the first vision as recorded in the Prolific Price. So that's one. Our course of study for next year in Come Follow Me is the Book of Mormon. You may wish to ponder important questions such as, how would my life be different if my knowledge gained from the Book of Mormon were suddenly taken away? Or, how have the events that followed the first vision made a difference for me and my loved ones? So he's given, right there, there's three assignments. Read the first vision, Joseph Smith's Pearl of Great Price account. That's the 1838 account. And ponder those two questions. Also, with the Book of Mormon videos now becoming available, you may wish to incorporate them in your individual and family study. Keep studying. Last paragraph. Select your own questions. I would like you to think about what are some other questions that we should be pondering over the next few weeks. Design your own plan. Very interesting. Our prophet says, I gave you three things to do but I want you to create your own plan. Immerse. That's not a dip. That's not a sip. Immerse yourself in the glorious light of the restoration. As you do, conference, general conference next April will not only be memorable, it will be unforgettable. So, I want to show you a couple of things. that some ideas that can help you. Let me pull something up on the screen here for a moment. As you ponder and think about this. Blow this up so you can all see this. This is live internet, so if it's slow. This is the Joseph Smith Papers. Again, if you just Google Joseph Smith Papers or go josephsmithpapers.org, you'll have a big screen on there. If you scroll down to the bottom, there is something called the First Vision, a Joseph Smith Papers podcast. These are great. There are, I think there's six, one, two, three, four, five, six podcasts <coughs> that, and they vary from just a few minutes to, I think the longest one is 40 minutes, 15, 20, 28, 8, 44, so they're fairly short, 44 being a long one. Great drive. Listen to these podcasts. These are the scholars who have put together the Joseph Smith papers who are reanalyzing and reviewing the first vision. So there's some really fun things in there. Plus, on there you have the Joseph Smith papers themselves. I wish I could see that better. I'm just going to show you Joseph Smith papers. Can you 
I can try. Does that help? Yeah. In here they have documents, journals, administrative records, revelations, translations, histories, legal stuff. Lots of fun stuff in there. So just briefly, I'd like to have you share what are some other things that we could just possibly include in our personal preparation for general conference? I just shared one with you. Do you have any others? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. The Saints, the book, it's now in your Gospel Library app. In fact, I'll walk you through a couple things with the Gospel Library app. That I'll show you even where that's at, because that's a great one. I'm glad you brought that up. If you're in the Gospel Library, if you go to the... There's a button called Church History. That's where the new uh, My 2020 Invitation to You from President Nelson's in there. Saints Volume 1 and Volume 2 is in there. And see where it says First Vision? If you click on that, you have some First Vision things, including a video and then the four accounts that Joseph Smith wrote of his First Vision. The Pearl of Great Price one is the 1838 one. But if you'll notice, there's two other accounts that he wrote, and then we have five other accounts of somebody else writing in their journal. Joseph told them what happened, and they wrote it down. So we actually have nine different uh, accounts of the first vision. Four from Joseph and five from others. Great. Somebody else have an idea or a thought? Well, if you... Oh, they are. But it, just a comparison is simple to know. But this morning I got up late. So I didn't have breakfast. I was telling you about how fast I got up and got out, but I didn't tell you I had breakfast for on the way home, too. So I'm telling you that. That's right. That's another account. Absolutely. The more accounts you have, the better it is. Love it. Thank you. So I just thought it was here is the character. How did he die? Oh, yeah. You get two good versions, but then if you cross reference it, Joe Smith did it. Sure. Well, I love it. In fact, your argument here, let me show you something here. If you'll go to, if you're in the church history tab and you go to church history topics, there's a whole list of topics in there. You could study any of those, they're all church history related. There's also. Uh, in the Church History Library, there's one called Gospel Topics Essays. These are fabulous. What the church did here is they had scholars pick some of our quirky or unique or interesting historical aspects of our church history and write an, uh, an essay about it. For example, one of them is... First vision accounts. And it says, why do we have different accounts and why would they say different things? And you guys gave two points that they actually argue in that essay of why the accounts don't match perfectly. Four different people they're telling, four different stories. Great things to study about that. Uh, I like, uh, for one of my personal plans, as I put on there, to, to read all four accounts again, which I have just recently done. And, it, to me, it adds color to a three dimensions to a picture. Tons of stuff in here. They add more content to this all the time. There's no way you could do it all. I think that's why President Nelson's invitation is you come up with your own plan. What do you need to study? Because maybe mine's different than Bradford's, which might be different than yours. So come up with your own personal plan. In conclusion, here's my testimony. Uh, make General Conference memorable and unforgettable. And we'll do that over the next few weeks by what we do to prepare. And I testify that is true in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, next week, uh, I'll just give you the, the reference for next week. 
is 31 through 33. So there's only four chapters. Three chapters. I can count better than that. 31 through 33. We'll finish 2 Nephi. But we'll go straight into the, what they call the doctrines of Christ. They are, those are enjoyable. I enjoy studying those, and there are some great things in there. So we'll focus on the doctrines of Christ. So last week you had a ton of chapters because they covered all the Isaiah ones. Next week you only have three in all of your seven days. I mean, so if you read two and one a day, you, so there's good time to study. That's why I bring this up. There's other things to study besides those three chapters. Uh, let's have a closing prayer, and then if you want to stick around for any questions, we can do all of that.